Hey everyone, thank you for joining today. I'm really excited to talk with you today about uh, a topic of ambiguity. Um, so this is something that I certainly struggle with uh, a lot earlier in my product management career, and I think I still struggle with quite a bit. Um, and I think everyone still struggles with ambiguity. It's something that you uh, can't completely eliminate, and it's not something that you should completely eliminate. But over time, we can all you know learn like different frameworks and mindsets on like how to deal with ambiguity better, right? And this is going to be some of those topics I'm going to be talking about with you today. So what we'll cover today is first, you know, what are we talking about when we say ambiguity? And when you encounter ambiguity, what does it look like? Uh, how are you supposed to, to, to deal with something like that? And then what is your job as a product manager or a leader in your organization, right? You should be turning ambiguity, like the ambiguity that you encounter into structure for the rest of your organization. Um, and then when you're actually handling ambiguity and making decisions in an ambiguous environment, which decision should be fast versus slow? And then when you're actually making those decisions, when should you apply something like intuition versus something like statistical thinking? So a really great quote that, that I found uh, you know, a little while ago is between calculated risk and reckless decision-making lies the dividing line between profit and loss. And this is from uh, uh, an author named Charles Duhigg. And I think this is a really good example of something where you can see how there is actually a very fine line between something like reckless guessing versus actually taking calculated risk. And sometimes those calculated risks may look like they're guessing, but they're actually really not there. There's a lot of, of you know, work and effort that goes behind making the, the correct types of calculated risks. So first let's just frame what we're talking about, right? So when we're talking about ambiguity, we're talking about trying to make a decision when you have imperfect information and an uncertain outcome. So this is, you know, by definition, what really trying to make a decision in an ambiguous environment in the workplace really looks like. And, you know, we should talk a little bit about when ambiguity is acceptable and when ambiguity is not acceptable. So um, when you think about innovations, right, and innovations sometimes are, it's, you know, sometimes misused. Somebody be, might be doing something iterative that's not really something that's new or novel and call it an innovation. But true innovations are things when you're building something that really doesn't exist. Um, you're building something that users haven't ever really seen before. Um, so in those, those cases, ambiguity is actually expected and ambiguity is, is probably a good thing. You have no idea what's going to happen, right? But again, we're gonna learn some frameworks to ensure that it's not gonna be a complete guess even when you're innovating. And you know, by extension, startups are typically gonna be companies where there's gonna be more ambiguity because you're innovating more, right? Um, if you're a startup, you're most likely trying to disrupt an incumbent and you're trying to disrupt an incumbent, um, that typically means that, that you're trying to do something different, right? You're not trying to just copy what they're doing or else it's not really an innovation. And then how are you actually gonna beat this incumbent when you know they're at some kind of scale that, that you can't really achieve with their resources and their budget? Um, however, ambiguity is not acceptable in some cases. So if you have, product managers and leadership making decisions or processes that have ambiguity as an outcome, that's not, not, not a good thing. So this, these are cases where people really need to think through the decisions and their processes a little bit more to ensure that they're not um, you know, spreading ambiguity across the organization. But you know, don't sweat it. Really think about everything, you know, whether it's ambiguity or something else, everything is really just a problem and a solution, right? So you don't um, try to approach things from that type of mindset you know, be stoic, be, uh, you know, unemotional when you're trying to solve these different types of problems. And just note that ambiguity isn't always bad, right? It's actually expected. It's actually part of the job. Um, so it's, it's, you know, something that we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and you're not alone. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about now turning ambiguity into structure. So product managers and leaders and product managers are de facto leaders in their organization. Um, you are ambiguity filters. Ambiguity is part of your job. Your inputs will sometimes or often be ambiguous. Uh, and again, if you are working at a startup doing something innovative, you will probably encounter ambiguity all the time. Whereas maybe if you're at a bigger company and there's a lot more resources and roles and responsibilities and roadmaps that kind of don't really you know, move or, 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 or you know, adjust as much, then maybe ambiguity isn't gonna come up as often, but ambiguity is always gonna be there in, in, in some sense, right? However, even though your inputs will be ambiguous as PMs and leaders, your outputs need to be structured. Your outputs need to be thought through. Um, you really need to think through the secondary and tertiary effects of your decisions because your outputs cannot be ambiguous. So when we um, you know, kind of look a little bit at what type of inputs you get from say business and users, uh, you have a broad range of things, right? You have user feedback, you have complexity cost, um, 
business priorities that can shift fire drills that come up that you have to adapt to some big bets and innovations that you want to do competitive pressure and even user feedback can sometimes be ambiguous but then you have to distill all these different uh inputs and priorities and, and requests and make sure making sure that you're handing over to engineering very clear and unambiguous requirements right and you also have to be able to prioritize across all these competing priorities to make sure that they can you know in a very structured way you know build the things they need to build in order without too much you know context switching right um because that's kind of good that's going to be absolutely the death of engineering velocity is if you allow too much context switching on your engineering team because you're constantly shifting priorities or throwing things in there you really want to give them like just room to just build one thing after another sequentially um and of course obviously making the proper Trade-offs, right? You're going to always be making trade-offs for the business. Always be thinking about your opportunity cost, right? So if I decided to do A, what could I have done instead? And, you know, what would what would have happened if I had done B or if I had done C, right? But that's your job as a product manager, as a leader, is to make sure that you're distilling all of this ambiguity and, and mess, and everything that you give to engineering is structured output. Um, and in this way, you can help your organizations achieve scale and and you know really really good efficiency. On the other side, um, you also have engineering, right? So engineering is gonna have to give you a bunch of inputs as well when they're actually building products for you. Um, there's gonna be technical concepts that are really difficult to understand. So for engineering, they understand that perfectly. Product managers can mostly understand it, but then business users and not technical people may not understand anything at all. Features will often need explanations, right? Um, there are going to be delays that also need explaining. There's going to be complexity baked into, um, you know, all these different things around their approaches to doing things and their architecture and their design. Um, also, when issues come up, how do you actually communicate those issues back to the business, back to executives, back to users? And then also engineering themselves are constantly making trade-offs on how they build things, right? Um, but you have to take all of these things now on the engineering side and making sure that you are giving um, good structure and non-ambiguous outputs to business and users. A good framework to use is explain like I'm five. How would you explain all of these things to a five-year-old or how would you explain it to your grandmother, right? Um, these type of questions when they're sent to product managers is really to test your communication skills. Can you actually explain really complicated concepts in very simple ways that people can understand? Um, so you know, think about that as part of your job around communicating things is how can you take all these really complex things and then explain it to people so they can get it, right? Very clear roadmap and timelines. And again, from up here, because you have taken all of these um, ambiguous business and user inputs and giving engineering a lot of structure, then you should be able to have a very, um, you know, solid roadmap and timelines and maybe, you know, something three quarters out isn't extremely precise, but anything within one quarter should have some, you know, uh, um, predictability, right, to, to your deliveries and, and your timelines. And of course, documentation is so important, written communication and documentation for all these things that you're doing. Think about how this type of thing scales. If you have some internal document that explains a feature um, you know, to your support team or you have an external help desk document that helps people understand a feature, um, you, know, you can be talking about one document that helps 10,000, 10 million people, right, understand a specific feature without really having to ask people or, or get confused about it, or else internally people can just move on and kind of do everything they need to do based off of your documentation. So documentation is really, really important, and you really have to think through how, you know, you write things again so it's it's very easy to understand and you remove all sense of ambiguity from, from your outputs. So... You know, what we covered so far is, uh, you know, at least framing what ambiguity looks like and what the expectations are. So now let's talk about, you know, speed versus accuracy of your decisions, right? Um, so when we are making decisions, um, and it's always good to, to help frame things and set context for things as, as, you know, product managers and leaders, because this helps people to understand things better. So we're going to do this here as well. When you have less info um, with your decision making, um, this typically means that you have less data. So if you're not gonna wait around trying to get all the data, this means that you can move faster with your decisions, right? Um, more info will usually get you more accuracy, but less speed because you're waiting a little bit more time to process information. Um, and there's no black and white and there's no kind of spot that you always pick, right? This is a spectrum and it's gonna be based on your judgment and a whole bunch of different factors. Like it depends where on the spectrum you're gonna lie, right? And it's gonna be based on the projects that you're working on, your business and company priorities, your engineering resources, you know, uh, uh, other resources, budget. Um, everything is gonna be based on some specific set of factors and that's how you have to choose where on this timeline you have to go. But as I mentioned, there are frameworks for everything. I'm gonna teach all, all, all of these frameworks today. 
So some things to ask yourself about your decisions are, you know, is a decision reversible? Is it easily reversible or is it not easily reversible? Will it impact a lot of resources? And this could be people resources, it could be budget. And then what's the potential upside or downside? And in particular, we're really thinking about downside, right? Does it have a really high downside or a really low downside? Like what's the actual risk of this decision that you're going to make? And then looking at the speed versus accuracy again, uh, you know, kind of um, graph, we can look at this curve and think about what's the correct trade-off, right? So the blue box would then indicate that we are going to be going for a little bit less information, a little bit less data for the sake of speed. Whereas the orange intersection would be where we're going for a little bit more accuracy and a little bit more data and we're okay moving a little bit slower. But where do you pick, right? How do you actually pick where you go on the spectrum? And then we can kind of see where in the previous slide, we talked about reversible decisions. We talked about, you know, downside and upside. We talked about resources. So, you know, decisions that are easily reversible, decisions that have low downside, not a lot of risk, and decisions that expend a lot less resources, those are typically things where you can move a little faster and it's actually better to move a little faster. In particular, when you're trying to innovate, when you're working at a startup, speed is your, is your friend, right? Speed is actually your strength. Um, so getting things to market, moving fast, learning and iterating are things that you need to do. But, you know, um, you can look at this type of, you know, uh, Q&A going through your decisions to analyze when it's OK to move a little bit faster and wait for less, you know, wait for wait for uh, less data. Um, at, you know, looking at the orange intersection where we're actually, you know, maybe going for a little bit more accuracy, we look for decisions that are actually hard to reverse. Right. Decisions that have. Um, have high downside or decisions that have uh, that are extremely resource intensive. So in these cases, you may want to wait for a little bit more data before you actually just go make your decision because you don't want to do things that are then hard to reverse the things that do have like an enormous amount of risk. So now we've covered uh, not only you know what ambiguity is and what the expectations are, but then we've talked a little bit about you know where on a spectrum you should be making fast versus slow decisions. So now let's talk about the method in which you're making those decisions, right? So when do you apply intuition versus applying something like statistical thinking? A great question to ask are, are risks well-known? So if risks are well-known, this means that typically, uh, if risk is well-known, that means that you probably have a lot of data, right? Or data at least readily available. So then statistical analysis makes more sense if the data's right there, just look at it and analyze it, right? That's not really hard. You don't really need intuition as much when risks are well-known. But when risks are not well known, this is typically where you're not going to have maybe possibly any data at all. You have no idea what's going to happen. You don't know what the outcomes are. But this is where, again, you don't just stick your finger in the air and just kind of see where the wind is blowing. You do need to apply some kind of intuition, right, and educated guesses to at least get you moving in the right direction. You should be starting with a good thesis as, as to where you think this thing is going to go. So this is where qualitative analysis matters a little bit more, right? But, you know, as we said before, this isn't some kind of binary, like always intuition, always statistical analysis. There's always going to be a little bit of both, right? Where you have to apply some intuition, even when you have data. And then you are going to have to apply some data when you need to use more intuition. And that's really your job as a PM is making sure that you're thinking through all these factors and making the right decisions for your organization. And intuition, uh, you know, it's not magic, right? So again, it's not just like taking a wild guess. There is some method behind intuition. And because we're talking about ambiguity today, we're mostly going to be talking about what to do when risks are not well known and you need to use more intuition. So one really good example of uh, people who have to make decisions all the time with imperfect information and use their intuition a lot. Um, and I don't even want to say this is imperfect information, but this is almost like extreme amount of uh, no information. You, when you're playing poker, you have no idea what your opponent's cards are, right? So every decision that you make in poker is always something where you're missing an extremely critical piece of, of information across your decision. If you have multiple players in the hand, you don't know, right? Like four or five different data points when you're trying to make a decision. These are major, major data points. Um, so how do poker players actually make these decisions? And you know, on the screen, there's a couple of high stakes poker players here. The guy in the middle, you know, make with the glasses and the beard making a funny face, his name is Daniel Negreanu. Um, he is actually one of the elite poker players has been playing this game for 15, 20 years and he's still one of the elites. Um, he made an incredible fold in this hand. So he has Jack 10 with a six, with a seven, eight, nine, which gives him a straight, where his opponent, the guy in the crew cut, uh, has a full house, nine, nine, eight, eight. Uh, that's a really, really hard hand <laughs> to detect that he has, or just to guess that he has. And Jack 10 is such a strong hand that it's really hard to fold in the spot. 
But this player, Daniel Negreanu, has made a career out of constantly just making these right decisions in these really high, you know, intense pressured moments for a lot of money. Um, so that repeatability means that he's not some kind of wizard that's just kind of guessing, right? There has to be some way in which he's doing this. Um, so hand reading, just, you know, like using intuition is actually not magic. It's based on observation. It's based on pattern recognition. It's based on something like structured hand analysis where, you know, based on the opponent's tendencies, based on their position, how much they're betting, the speed in which they're betting, you can mostly start to narrow down the, the range of hands that they have. You can use math. And then, you know, really, really importantly, you can use critical thinking, probabilistic thinking to try to get within a range of hands so that you can make those right decisions, right? Um, but you can see from this that this also takes an intense amount of preparation. These are not things that you just figure out at the table. These are things that you need to study and practice and run past others, just like any other vocation. You really have to work hard at this. It's just why, you know, you see the same players year after year after year over, you know, like a decade. They're all the same players doing really, really well. Now, <clears throat> you know, switching back over to product managers and leaders in a business environment, same thing. Good intuition comes from hard work. It's not guesswork, right? Um, when you see PMs and leaders who seem to guess right very, very often, it's because they actually deeply understand their market and users. They have good product sense. And you can usually tell when you're talking to a product manager with, with good product sense, they very quickly can get on the same page with you, uh, you know, arriving at what your user problems are and what your you know, core user segments are, what your business objectives are. And they can very quickly switch into thinking about really good and novel ideas on how to solve these problems. So having a good product sense definitely helps. Um, they're also constantly learning, keeping up to date on trends. They can critically think and, again, consider those secondary and tertiary effects to remove ambiguity and these unintended consequences of decisions. They also know how to measure what matters, right? So what even if you are making something uh, that with risks that are well known, you still want to make sure that you're measuring uh, whether or not that thing succeeded or failed when you actually finally get into production, or if it's just simply a decision, what things you measure to make sure that the decision was effective, right? Um, so all of these things you can tell just like poker players, it takes a, a lot of preparation and study to make sure that you're able to then deploy your intuition correctly, right? So people who seem to guess right a lot, again, it's not magic. It's not like they were born with some like instinct right that, that helps them guess better but a lot of these people work really really hard and they really understand you know the 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 environment and the ecosystem that they're working in and then lastly with all this information you can then think probabilistically and use heuristics to actually make this guesswork a little bit less like guesswork and more like calculated you know risk taking and we're going to go over specifically what thinking probabilistically is and then what using heuristics are so probabilistic thinking is, you know, thinking about when you make a decision, there are many, many possible outcomes, right? And some of those outcomes are complete outliers and things that would probably never happen and things you kind of don't need to sweat. Um, but then there's some percentage of that, of that, that uh, all the potential outcomes that would be good outcomes, right? And sometimes it's a lot of good outcomes. Sometimes it's not a lot of good outcomes. So as an example, if I were in a poker hand um, and I was on, you know, the last betting round, which is the river, and I think that if I bet you know, half the pot, right? 50% of the pot. So there's a thousand dollars in a pot and I bet $500. I'm going to assign some probabilities to what might happen, right? So I think there's a 50% chance that the user is going to call me or the, the other player is going to call me. I think there's a 25% chance that that player is going to fold and then a 25% chance that that player is going to raise me. Um, so I want to think through what do I actually want the outcome to be? So if my hand is strong and I think it's the best hand, but it's not exactly the best hand and I'm not sure, um, I think I'm going to want that person to call me, but I don't want that person to fold. But I definitely don't want that person to raise because then if he raises me, this means that, you know, he's indicating that he has a better hand than me. But I'm not sure because, again, I don't know what his cards are and he could be bluffing me, right? So I think what the best outcome that I want is, is I just want this person to call. And then as I had said, if I had bet half the pot, I'm going to assign a 50% probability that he's going to call me. So that is the highest probability. So I think that the best choice is going to be just to bet half the pot to get the, out, the most probable outcome that I want. Of course, 25% of the time, he's still going to raise me. 25% of the time, he's still going to fold. But just because he does one of the things I didn't want him to do, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was a bad decision, right? Because I had still at least assigned what I thought was the correct probability to get him to do what I wanted. But then again, going back to measuring what matters, you want to make sure that, that you're evaluating that decision. Was I correct about that 50% or was it actually more like 30%, right? Um, and this is where 
knowing everything about your users in your market allows you to analyze that data a little bit better. Um, but poker players are constantly thinking about, about these type of things. So moving this over into like a product management type of uh, a problem, let's say that you are changing something. Let's just say that you're working on a social media app and you decide to, you know, drastically change something in the feed that has never existed before. So you don't know what's really going to happen and you don't really have, you know, good measurements in place that kind of judge. Um, then you can also assign probabilities to those outcomes as well. So if we just take like the good outcome part of this graph and you blow it up into all these different types of outcomes. So just like a poker hand, you can say that outcome one, these are all four good outcomes. Outcome one has a 60% chance of happening. Outcome two has a 20% chance. Three has a 15% chance. Four has a 5% chance, right? These may not be exact numbers. These may just be things where they're just kind of estimates. And, you know, based on what you know about the market and users, you think these are what the outcomes are going to be. So it could be that 60% of the time that you make a drastic change to your social media feed, um, people are going to... Uh, absolutely hate it, right? And they're going to just maybe not immediately just flee, but then you'll just start seeing things like time spent on site. You see your DAUs kind of slowly dropping over time. And then maybe you assign something like a 20% outcome to that, right? And then there might be like a 15% outcome that people are absolutely just going to hate it and leave immediately. And you see your day use drop by half the day after, but that's probably not going to happen, right? Outcome four might be that people absolutely love it. Uh, uh, and then immediately your DAUs triple right on, on, on that very day. But then the most likely outcome that's going to happen is that, you know, maybe 10% of the people are going to hate it and they're going to complain. But then over time, the, the changes that you made help the UX of it better and help the value of, of your product better, that people will slowly start just spending more time on site and you see your DAUs, you know, climbing over time. But by doing this exercise of thinking through all the potential outcomes of your decisions, uh, trying to assign the probabilities for it, um, gets you a little bit closer to something that seemed like a complete guess in an ambiguous environment to something where you can actually assign probabilities to outcomes. The secondary benefit to this is that by thinking through all the outcomes and what all the potential outcomes are, you won't be surprised when the 5% outcome comes through, right? And again, just because the 5% outcome comes through doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, or even if one of the bad outcomes comes through, it doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad thing. You were still, uh, pretty sure that from everything you knew about your users, that these probabilities were correct, right? And then after you measure what matters and you think this through a little bit more and you're still pretty sure about that 60% outcome, even though for the, in, in the first moment, the 5% outcome came through, you probably want to just apply a little bit of grit and keep going with that outcome one to make sure that you know you want to basically validate, was I completely wrong about the 60%? If I'm relatively sure, you probably just don't want to give up on that idea just yet, right? Um, as an example of Airbnb had given up on their idea in the beginning when everyone told them that their idea was completely crazy, you know, Airbnb would never have become Airbnb. So these are things where sometimes you need to make sure that you're being process oriented instead of outcome oriented, but you need to also make sure that you are thinking through all the outcomes and trying to assign probabilities to those outcomes and this type of probabilistic thinking is really how poker players and very good PMs and, and leaders who make good decisions are constantly thinking about the world. Um, so, you know, after we think through some potential outcomes and assign probabilities to them, how are we actually making those decisions in real time, right? Um, and the use of heuristics is, is really, really important to, to, to learn about. So if you guys don't know about heuristics, definitely Google it. There's a lot of really good scholarly articles and blog posts that talk about it. Um, but Heuristics allow you to make fast and accurate, but not like perfect decisions, right? When you don't have a lot of data. And there are a couple, and there are actually many, many different types of heuristics, but uh, we're gonna cover two of them today, which is rules of thumb and the availability heuristic. But then there are also things that you can do like educated guesses and trial and error. And the important thing to know about heuristics is they can be a double-edged sword, right? When used incorrectly, um, heuristics can cause biases, a lot of cognitive biases that go in the wrong direction. So you have to be careful with that, right? So like everything else, you know, with PM, um, just learn the, you know, the proper way to use heuristics, but then those heuristics will let you uh, deal with ambiguity in, you know, your problem statements and your decision making a lot better. So rule of thumb and availability heuristics. So a rule of thumb is something where it's like a, a procedure, like a really easy to remember procedure or kind of standard um, that you can apply to a lot of different situations, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, if people watch baseball or even play baseball, you um, sometimes it can look like a very, very boring sport. But baseball has a lot of stuff going on, right? There's all these like different rules that that these baseball players kind of try to remember. As an example, if you're on base and then the ball is hit in front of you in the air, um, you should go back to your previous base and tag up right before you go. If the if you're on second base and the ball is hit on the ground in front of you, you should not try to advance. If you see a fly ball in the air, um, 
when the ball is above the bill of your cap, that means you should keep running back. And if the ball is below the bill of your cap, that means you should, you should run forward, right? When you think about even what that kind of fly ball, you know, cap of your bill type of heuristic does, is instead of asking the outfielder to try to calculate the trajectory of a ball every single time, they can mostly just remember like, okay, so here's where the ball is, I have to run back, here's where the ball is, I have to run forward. And then, you know, 99% of the time, that's gonna get you to the right thing, right? Um, so that's why these heuristics are, are important to, to use because you can take things that are sometimes really hard to measure in real time and you don't really have time to measure them in real time, but you can still mostly get to a very fast and very accurate decision without having to wait for all the data, right? And then we're going to go through an extreme example about that in, in a minute. But then the availability heuristic is things where you, you're trying to use similar examples. So as an example, if you're to build, if you were to do something with a social media feed that has never existed before, um, you can say in one sense, I have no idea what's going to happen, but you can probably still find similar examples of things, maybe not the exact same situation, but at least in a similar, like almost ballpark type of, of, of scenario. And then kind of measure what happened there and then probably take, you know, some learnings from that to try to apply it to what you're doing. And again, it's not going to be a perfect fit and it's not going to be a perfect prediction, but you know that a little bit of data is better than nothing. <clears throat> so, one other example of rule of thumb, other than those, you know, little ones that you learn about baseball, is there is this, this real life example of a plane, um, you know, from years ago that had taken off from LaGuardia Airport in New York, um, and only a few minutes out, unfortunately, they ran into like this flock of geese, and the geese got unfortunately got sucked through the engines, knocked both of the engines out, and now this commercial plane with all these passengers was was in big trouble, right? Um, so immediately they're like, okay, let's just see if we can land back at LaGuardia. Um, before you know the plane is already descending, the engines are cut out. Can I land back in LaGuardia safety safely? Because that is basically the safest outcome that we can have for the plane. Um, so obviously the engines are cut. Uh, they're already descending, and they don't have time to take all these measurements, try to radio the tower, and then calculate where they're going to go. So they basically use this rule of thumb. And this is an interesting thing that I learned is that when you're looking out of the cockpit of a plane and you see some point in the distance, if that point in the distance is descending as in it's going down like below your, your your window or windshield, this means that you're going to overshoot that target. If that point in the distance is ascending or going up, this means that you're not going to reach that target, right? You're going to undershoot the target. So they looked at LaGuardia Airport, and I think they were probably looking at some tower there, and they noticed that that tower was actually ascending, which means that they were not going to reach LaGuardia. And here's the dangerous thing is that, you know, I don't know if anybody knows the New York airports, but surrounding New York airports is a lot of residential areas, right? So if you just undershoot LaGuardia, you can crash and just, you know, really just kill a lot of people if you land in a residential area. So by using that rule of thumb and without having to do all these calculations, they very quickly realized we're not going to make it back to LaGuardia. So they changed course to go out towards the ocean. And then they, you know, thankfully made a safe landing in the ocean. Everybody survived. Um, but, you know, this is an example, uh, you know, a good example of what a rule of thumb is. So thinking about how you can apply that, right? So think about how you can also apply these like macros, right? To how you make your own decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, because as product managers, you have to remember that you have to be decisive. As leaders, you also have to be decisive, right? People can't be waiting around for weeks and weeks and weeks for you to think about stuff or come up with more data. You have to be decisive in the moment, but again, you shouldn't just guess and then cause ambiguity and thrash in your organization. But by using things like a good rule of thumb and other heuristics, you can basically ensure that your decisions are a little bit you know, uh, less ambiguous and more thought through. So next, um, uh, heuristic that we're going to talk about is is the availability heuristic or or um, you know similar examples. So if anybody's familiar with Quibi, and I actually haven't used Quibi yet, but Quibi is a you know a, a new uh, a new product or platform that allows you to watch uh, these videos, right? These like little quick videos. They're ten minutes or less, but these videos are professionally done. You know, professional uh, you know production people and professional writers. You actually have like Hollywood, like you know, A-list actors, you know, doing all these little short, um, you know, ten-minute, eight-minute shows or or whatever uh, that are available on the platform to watch. And then when you think about that, and even when you look at you know all these different investors and analysts, they they really nobody has any idea what Quibi is going to do, right? <laughs> um, we have no idea if this product is going to succeed or fail, and it's because nothing has has come out like this before. We have no idea. Um, however, you can probably look at things like Netflix. So even though Netflix can't really apply because this doesn't really exist as a Netflix model, but maybe you can look at things on Netflix where, you know, 
you know, four episodes that had, you know, uh, you know, basically like a, a, a shorter time span, right? How did they do relative to everything else? You can even look at other platforms, like maybe like a Twitch or a YouTube, just to, you know, look at data from similar examples. And I'm pretty sure this is what, you know, the founding team at Quibi was looking at when they were even deciding to do this, is let's try to, you know, use what we know about the users in the market. Let's try to use the availability or stick to what other data we might have available out on the market that at least directionally shows us, you know, where this, this product might go. And then use that, right, to, to judge whether or not we should do this thing. Um, so whatever that they used, you know, I, I think they had decided because of, you know, how much money got put into this to put this out, that this would be a successful product. So we'll see, you know, I, I, we'll see how Quibi does, you know, over, over the next few months. Um, but I think this is a good example of, you know, using an available, availability heuristic when you're trying to make decisions for a product or for your team. Now, another availability here stick is actually COVID, right? So COVID, um, you know, is a coronavirus. It's a novel coronavirus that's never existed before. And even though it's definitely not the flu, um, it is, you know, a virus within that same kind of family of different coronaviruses and different influenza viruses. So, um, you know, as an example, we noticed that people who have recovered from coronavirus have antibodies, right? Um, they've also taken blood transfusions from people with antibodies and put them into people who were, you know, very serious condition, and they saw some improvements. Um, I don't think anybody has come out and specifically said that antibodies 100% fight the coronavirus. And nobody knows how long these antibodies stay in your system, although there's a little bit of guiding data on that already. Um, but again, with the availability heuristic, you can at least say, you know, at least we can directionally make a theory that this should probably behave like other viruses that we've seen. So maybe antibodies will stay in your system like six months, just like it does with everybody else. And just, uh, and these antibodies will fight the virus to some extent, right? Just like all the other viruses do. So this is another good example of, you know, using something like similarity or availability or stick when uh, things are extremely unknown, like a completely new virus that's never, you know, hit humans before. Okay, so <clears throat> to wrap up, um, what we covered today is making sure that you are capable of embracing ambiguity. Ambiguity is not always bad and ambiguity is actually expected and it's part of the job, but then your job as a product manager and a leader is to make sure that you're removing ambiguity for others at all times, right? For your engineering teams, your users, your internal teams, your executives. Um, then also, you know, think about when you decide to use speed versus accuracy in your decisions based on downside, right? Are the risks high or the risks not high, right? And reversibility, is that decision easily reversible? And what are the resources that are needed to, to make these, these decisions? Um, and then use intuition when risks are not well known because you're not gonna have a lot of data and intuition is okay, but it's really, really important to know that intuition is not guessing. It's not like a blank check for you to just guess at things. Um, intuition is based on knowledge, thinking, preparation, right? The very, very best people take all this time to master their craft so that they can make the proper decisions and, you know, in the moment. And, you know, thinking through all your outcomes probabilistically and then using heuristics to make your decisions a little bit less like winging it um, are really good frameworks to use when you, you are, you know, faced with ambiguity in, in, your, in your roles. So um, for anybody who's interested, I'm also doing a live chat on July 16th for product school. I'd love to see you all there. Um, we're gonna be just covering a whole broad range of questions. Anything you guys want to, to, to ask and I'll answer them to you uh, for, you know, about being a product manager, about, you know, your career aspirations, anything like that. Um, we'd love to see you there. You can also uh, RSVP on Eventbrite and find this on our product school site. I've also written a book. Uh, it's called Bet, Bill, Go, uh, Build Startups Like a Poker Player. So, you know, from my poker example, I actually was a semi-professional poker player. Um, I don't play as much anymore, but, you know, I definitely took a lot of what I learned um, from my poker career to actually make myself a better product manager. And I had recently just given a talk at product school um, talking about this. So you can also check that out. But in this book, I cover a lot of really good concepts around like how to make, uh, you know, decisions in terms of risk, right? What are the complexity costs? things that you have to consider. How do you make trade-offs? Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, how do you, you know, um, why should you not be uh, so outcome oriented and be a little bit more process oriented and how do you be more resilient, right? When you're, when you're building companies. Um, so these are, this is a really, really fun book to read. Um, so if you want to check it out, it's available on Amazon. Um, you can also just, you know, if you're looking at the paperback copy, you can just read a chapter for free just on Amazon itself if you want to check it out. Um, so connect with me. So here's my book. Uh, it's on Amazon, Bet, Bill, Go. My event right for, uh, for product school. The live chat is on July 16th. 
on LinkedIn. That's my link. Um, if you want to add me, uh, just, you know, mention that you saw, uh, you know, one of my talks on product school and you wanted to ask me some questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you about anything. Um, my Twitter handle is Quan's full and I also have a blog, which I don't really keep updated that much. Um, it's called that will go as well. Um, so thank you uh, everyone for joining today. It was a lot of fun talking about this, uh, you know, um, and helping everyone, you know, understand how they can handle ambiguity a little bit better and good frameworks to use. Um, and I will see you guys next time.